My event occurred over a two or three day period. It wasn't all at once. Uh, I was flying missions. Uh, I was stationed in Barbers Point at Barbers Point Naval Air Station uh, on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. It was, uh, it was in 1982 and it was during the RIM pack exercise, uh, military exercise, RIM of the Pacific it's called. It's the biggest military exercise in the world. They do it every two years and it was my, my air crew, I have a whole team of guys I flew with. Uh, we were on crew six, flight crew six, so it was our turn to go fly a mission. And it was, it's a long range patrol airplane, so we were going out for a 12, 13 hour flight. And so this is a big four engine heavyweight turboprop airplane that weighs over 70 tons. And uh, so we took off and had full load of fuel. We were at max allowable takeoff weight. Um, and we got, it, got to about 10,000 feet of altitude and had a malfunction on number one engine and we had to shut it down. So obviously we're not gonna go do the mission. We need to go back and declare an emergency. And we dump fuel, but you can only dump a certain amount of fuel because you need to get down to uh, uh, what's called max allowable land weight. And if you land any heavier than that, you take a risk of damaging the structural integrity of the airplane that may never fly again. So we had to fly around for another 45 minutes or so to burn down to max land weight. And because we're heavy, we have to come in a lot faster than normal. Now we still had 42,000 pounds of fuel on board when we touched down. We typically land with only 8,000. So that'll give you an idea of the difference of the weight of the aircraft. And because you're heavy, heavier, you have to fly a lot faster. So we were probably coming in at around 100, I'm not gonna do it knots, most people will understand miles per hour. So we were coming in at around 150 to 155 miles per hour. And because it's an emergency, declared an emergency, you have fire trucks, emergency responding trucks on this, literally on the side of the runway. And they, they are, here's the runway and they will park at an angle and as you go by on the runway, they'll pull in behind you and chase you. And then there's two more down and they'll pull in after you go by them behind the other two on, on, and so on. There's usually six fire trucks, three on each side. And that's normally a good thing. Uh, but today, that day it was not. Uh, so we were landing on parallel runways and we landed on the left one, it was 040 was the heading, so we were landing on four left. When the main mounts came down, everything was okay. When the nose gear touched down, I believe the pilot, Lieutenant Lovegren, used it, uh, the wrong rudder. And instead of correcting for a swerve that we expected to go to the right, because you have two engines giving you reverse thrust on one side versus one on the other, you expect a swerve and you should put in left rudder. He put in right rudder. And at those speeds, we departed the runway pretty much right away. And, and the problem with the fire trucks was they were sitting right there and we're headed directly at the one on the right side. And um, there's a guy on the water cannon on top with a firefighter with the silver suit and we are headed directly at this fire truck. I had death coming at me at 150 plus miles an hour and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. And I remember thinking the last thing I was thinking was, oh my God, my son. I had a two and a half year old son and I'm like, I'm never gonna see my son again. And, uh, and about that time, I, everything started changing. It, was, it went slow motion, it was really bizarre. And my, I had these different perspectives happen. I was, my soul leapt out of my body and now I'm out of the airplane with, looking down on it. I can see everything, I know where the fire trucks are but I'm still in my engineer's seat and I've got that perspective. And then <clears throat> the, I, the right wing tip went over the front left corner of the fire truck. I could see that guy on the water cannon screaming at the top of his lungs. I couldn't hear him, of course, because I'm in the plane, but I could see him screaming in terror. <clears throat> and the number four propeller is spinning, right? The outboard right-hand propeller and moving forward at 150 plus miles an hour and it had to have gapped the front corner of that fire truck. That's how close we came to it as it's spinning without hitting it. And, and I just, you know, there's a difference between I think I'm gonna die and I'm dead and I know it. There's a big difference in that. And that's where I was at. And so when I, I was out of body, about that time he went into reverse thrust and because we're on asphalt, it's not, planes don't normally travel on. There's a lot of dust and debris out there. And somewhere, from somewhere, this Pepsi can came up and shot across the windshield from left to right. It probably took milliseconds, right? But I could, 
it was slow motion. I'm seeing this thing tumble. Pepsi, I could see Pepsi, it's a Pepsi can. 12 ounces, I could see that, the fluid coming out of it, brown fluid, and, and then it atomized the fluid as it hit the air, the wind that was hitting it, and the turbulence. And uh, uh, I started focusing on the little bitty pieces of debris, and then all of a sudden, I didn't just have my outside perspective and the inside perspective, I became the debris. I was where every tiny piece of debris was, uh, all wrapping and rolling around each other, but I had a 360 degree bubble vision view from every one of these millions of perspectives and the tiniest piece of debris that was in the air. And I'm totally confused. You'd think it would be chaotic, right? It was a bit confusing because I didn't understand what was going on really, but it was, there was this, uh, this sublime perfection going on. Everything was right where it was supposed to be doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing, exactly when it was supposed to be doing it, and everything was perfect. I had that, I don't know how I knew that, but I felt it. It was more like a feeling and an understanding and a knowing than, but it confused me at the same time. So all of this is going on, and we're still cruising across the asphalt at an angle away from the runway. The fire trucks have turned, and they're catching up to us, and all of them are starting to chase us. Uh, and we ended up all the way across the asphalt and ended up halfway on and halfway off runway four right. So there's some slope on the edges of the runway so rain can run off and we had bounced up on that slope and uh, the right main mount and the nose gear were on the runway and the left main mount wasn't and we're kind of sitting like this when we got stopped. And when we stopped, uh, my outer perspective of all these things just kind of went back into me and I was just me again and I'm like, what the hell happened? What was that? And, like, and I, I want to say something, but I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. And I look at Lieutenant Duffy in the right seat, and he, I saw him slump. So I knew he just came off his ad adrenaline rush. And when I came off mine, I felt like I just ran five marathons back to back. I was a young, healthy, 24-year-old, physically fit, and I was exhausted. And uh, I looked at him and watched him slump, and he turns his head to look at me. And now we've got our eyes are, we're looking eye to eye. And I want to ask him, did you have that too? I was, didn't know what to say. I wanted to say something, but I just couldn't say anything, couldn't get it out. And about that time, I heard this noise behind me, woo, woo sound, and watched Duffy's eyes shift over my shoulder to see what it was. And I turned my head and Lieutenant Lovegren, the, guy, the pilot, I loved the guy, he was a great pilot, but he gooned the landing that day. Uh, he's in stress still, and he's white knuckling the yoke, and he's looking straight ahead, and he's trying to say something. You, you can see the stress in his face, and he couldn't get it out, and he's going, woo, woo, and he finally goes, what the f did I do wrong? <laughs> you know, it's like I just couldn't believe that. And, uh, and then the fire trucks caught up to us, we sat there for a few minutes uh, trying to determine if everything was okay, if the plane was damaged or whatever, and it wasn't. And we added power, pushed the power levers up, and got up on the runway four right and rolled out and went to the hangar. So I literally made a one approach and one landing in a four engine heavyweight airplane doing a three engine emergency landing, and I used two entirely different runways to do that with, and I don't ever want to do that again. Um, and and then the next day, the commanding officer took me and the Lieutenant Lovegren back out and we just went out to go shoot touch and goes. And back then, the post-traumatic stress wasn't even a term. It didn't exist yet. And so they kind of, they wouldn't do this today because they'd put you through psychiatric uh, evaluations and all that if you had an incident like that. But back then, they didn't do that. The skipper took us out, put us back in the saddle to see if we can go handle it. That's kind of how they did business back then. And, um, and I just didn't even consider it would be a problem. And so uh, on the first approach, my, I have a 180 degree commanding view of the flight station because my seat is in the center seat facing forward and I can see all of it. And so I typically sit up and one of my jobs is if there's an emergency or, or something on the runway and we have to wave off at the last minute, my job is to be ready for the push the power levers to wave off. And I started panicking. I could not look outside because this is the same view I had the day, the very day before, right before the incident. 
and I, I didn't, didn't even know what was going on. I had anxiety in a big way, and I did not, the skipper, my commanding officer was sitting right next to me, but he's a little bit after me, just by the way our seats sit. And I bent over and put my hand on the power levers because I couldn't look outside and I wanted it to look like I had my head in the game and I was doing my job when what was really going on is I was freaking out. But I didn't want my skipper to know because I knew if he knew, I'd never fly again. And after three or four landings, I had to convince myself, like Tony, you've done thousands of landings, got over 3,500 hours flight time. It's probably never going to happen again. You need to get your head in the game and get back to work. And I had to work through that and after a while, I was okay. Uh, and I never had that issue again. But then the next day, on Wednesday, it was in the evening, and I think what happened in the airplane kind of uh, prepared me or opened a doorway or something. I don't know how to explain it, but they're related. I know that, I just don't know how. Uh, and I, said a, I was watching television, and we were watching a show called That's Incredible. And they had a, a guest on there called, uh, his name was Leslie Lemke. You can probably look him up on YouTube. He's still on YouTube and he had no cognitive skills beyond that of a one-year-old, his entire, uh, one-day-old, his entire life. And this woman had adopted him. And so she heard music late, and the reason he's on the show, they had heard music in the middle of the night one night, and uh, uh, she went downstairs to turn off the radio or TV, that's what she, she, she's thinking. Here's Leslie playing the piano and singing gospel music with a sweet voice, and then they brought him out and introduced him, and he did that. And I was just, his, I, he had what I call a hauntingly holy voice. It just penetrated my heart and I'm like, I'm seeing my first miracle. I knew it. I now know everything's a miracle, but I didn't understand that at 24. I'm thinking I'm seeing my first miracle. And so I went to bed that night and I said a simple prayer of gratitude, thanking God for just genuine gratitude in my heart, letting me see a real miracle. And then I added the words, <laughs> at the end of that prayer and I just said and Lord it'd be nice if you could do something like that for me someday and you don't expect anything I mean why would you you know it's just a little prayer that lasted maybe 10 seconds in your head and I went to sleep and uh, sometime in the middle of the night uh, we called it oh dark 30 in the military uh, I don't have any idea what time it was three or th in the morning something like that all of a sudden I had an instantaneous shift in consciousness. I didn't go through a tunnel, I didn't die, I didn't do any of that, it was boom. Next thing I know, I'm in a black void and I'm seeing this golden white light, beautiful, magnificent, gigantic, pouring out energy and light and profound unconditional love that was hitting me, filling me up and it was powerful. The power that, and I knew I was in the presence of my Creator. I knew it. And the love was unbelievable. Uh, it's infinite power that that love controls. And I knew that if this being did not want me to exist anymore in half a thought, I'd be gone forever. But there was this feeling of benevolence being no words were spoken to me. This was all done with energy, of emotional energy. I don't even, I can't explain it. I don't know how to explain that, but that's what was going on. And the benevolence was equally infinite and, and was letting me know how precious I, I was to this being. And I felt like, this is the best analogy I've been able to come up with yet over the decades. It felt like it was the, I was, it was the end of the life of the universe. And I was, so precious that I was being loved, held, and cradled by every mother that ever lived, everywhere, every when, all at once. And I was just dumbfounded. I couldn't believe what I was experiencing. And as wonderful as that sounds, as an analogy, you need to understand this. That analogy absolutely sucks. It does not come close. I could speak about this for a billion years nonstop and I would never be able to express it properly. That's why it's ineffable. And uh, but that's the best description I've been able to come up with so far. Um, and um, I said three words in just dumbfounded awe of uh, what I was feeling and experiencing. And I just said, oh my goodness. And the essence of goodness just exploded through me, ripped through everything of me, and uh, 
And then there was joy and bliss and ecstasy and peace and harmony all on a cosmic scale. And it was like when God, when I first saw God or God saw me or whatever, it was like God, God was insanely in love with me. I had no idea love could be like that. And it was like God's throwing a cosmic party. There was no sound, but there's this cosmic party going on. God's going, everybody love Tony's back, everybody. <laughs> and, uh, I was just, oh, it's 35 years ago and it still does that to me. Oh my God. And I was home. There was this energy that I knew I was home, finally home. And uh, I think God did what he did next because he knew me and I'm an engineer. I have a mind of an engineer. I need proof. I'm very pragmatic, logical, down to earth kind of guy. <laughs> And if he had not done this, uh, what he did next, I would have probably written it all off as just a dream. Uh, but what happened next is this moment in all of this happening, when I was in the light where I had this, or I call the urge to merge. There's this deep instinctive desire to go be in the light. It's all you want. You don't want anything else. I had a wife and a two and a half year old son, didn't even think about them. You can't because your consciousness is just overwhelmed with all this and that's all you want is to go deeper in the light. And when that happened, I physically sat up in bed and had my arms out and when I opened my eyes and my face is all wet and, and then there was, and I'm looking at, at the foot of the bed at the wall at the other end of the room and there's no wall. <laughs> The, the light is in my bedroom. God's in my bedroom. It was like a billion stars lit up the room and I could see my wife's feet out of the peripheral vision of my eyes and I knew she had her back to me. But I'm thinking, how can she sleep through this? It's like bright as it can be in here. How can she sleep through this? And then I went, this is real. I had enough time to think, this is happening. I could God in my bedroom. This is real. And as soon as that happened and I knew it was real, I was saying it in my head, the, it was like a 10 foot circle, no wall. It all went, not in an instant, but it came down and just kind of went to the center from the outer edges and just went, and went away. And I, I just went, no. I just, I just lost the greatest love I'll ever know. It just got ripped away from me. And I don't know why I didn't get to stay. I don't know why it left. I didn't know, know anything. And I just sat there and the wall, it had this undulating spiritual energy or something in it for the rest of the night. And I sat there and just watched the wall because that's all I had left of it. And as the sun came up and the room slowly lit up and it faded away, and then my wife wakes up. <laughs> she, she sees me crying. She goes, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> oh, and I just cried. And I was finally able to tell her everything. I think she believed me, but... So that next Sunday, that's when I went to the church to ask for help and got nothing. Got, the guy walked away, just turned his back on me and walked away. And uh, it was a long time before I told anybody else about it. My wife knew, but I never said anything else. But it caused problems. Uh, it was very disruptive to my life. It affected me deeply. And everything else in my life that's occurred since then, that's the foundation. There's, there's before the light and there's after the light. Big difference in uh, my belief system. And so I went deep after that. I started learning about all religions. And everything I learned, I, I was always based on, on my foundation or my baseline was what I experienced in the light. That was the truth and I knew it. And nobody could tell me otherwise because I was there. And uh, so all these other religions had a lot of spiritual principles that applied with what I felt and saw and experienced on the other side, but um, they, but they also had man-made agendas in them. And that's when I said, I'm not doing that anymore. And I kind of just went into a spiritual perspective of a God of my own understanding. And I'm like, if I'm going to go find a God of my own understanding, I need to learn how did God do all this? How can I be here physically? How does all this exist? So here goes my engineer mind again. And I learned everything I could about the nature of the universe, which led me to studying the nature of consciousness. But I learned everything from subatomic particles and how they turn into atoms and then molecules and the nature of the, super, of the uh, 
uh, Big Bang and how galaxies were formed and solar systems and super everything, quasars, magnetars, you know, gamma ray burst, how that ha all of that, supermassive black holes. Nobody, no scientist anywhere can tell you how or where subatomic particles, how they pop in and out of existence or what happens when you cross the event horizon of a black hole. Nobody can tell you that. And only 4% of the universe can we actually detect. The other 96% is black, dark energy, dark matter. And they don't even really know what that is. So there's a lot we don't know. So I learned all that, and then I studied quantum, electronic, uh, quantum electric dynamics, quantum physics, uh, qu I learned about quantum entanglement. I studied the properties of light. And when I studied the properties of light, I learned about the double slit experiment where they put a piece of paper up with two vertical slits in it and they fired and they had a photosensitive material behind that and they fired one proton of light at a time at it while they were watching it. And they got what they expected. They got two slits, uh, two vertical lines on that uh, photosensitive material behind it. So they said, okay, let's do this again, but nobody watched. They have it all left. And they expected to have the two vertical slit uh, uh, lines on the photosensitive material, but they did not get that. They got a wave function. That means that two things, light is both a particle and energy wave at the same time, and it's affected by consciousness. And I was in the light. It was all light. Everything's made with light. That's why it all radiates. That's when I understood that consciousness affects light and everything is light and our consciousness has a direct impact on our universe and so uh, you know and and so prayer is powerful i tell people that now but what i've come to understand is uh, conscious prayer everybody knows and understands what its purpose is right what i now understand is it's all thought is prayer and it affects the entire universe because of quantum entanglement and so be careful what you pray for all day long. So I'm learning these things and now I'm coming to the point of understanding why love and positive thoughts and all of that is so important. And it's, as I've changed my way of thinking, I've literally changed my body and restoring my health, doing it that way and just being kind and loving as I can. Um, and all that stuff was really cool and neat to learn, but it really was a waste of time because all we have to do is just Love God with all our heart, and the way we do that is love each other unconditionally because God is in every one of us. So when I'm loving you, I'm loving God. So if I'm not loving you, I'm not loving God. And so love God with all our heart, love each other like that, learn how to love unconditionally, and take care of this planet. If we all did that, we'd have heaven on earth.